live. We're live? We're live. It's on? It's on. Is it this camera it's again? It's that camera right there. Awesome. What's up, everybody? Welcome to You Are Not Normal Podcast with Tony Mott. I got my good friend and storyteller Giovanni here who uh, does a fantastic job setting up these podcasts. That's my job. If I had to set up all these mics and cameras and all that, I mean, I would do it. You'd but fucking it, lose it. No, you wouldn't. It would, it would be a pain in my ass. You'd fucking lose it. I'd, I'd, get, I'd get upset. There'd be holes in the wall. Some shit would be upside down. For I am kind of like a baby when it comes to stuff like that. <laughs> that is a fault of mine. Like, if I can't figure something out... But it only happens in technology, really. That's a big police. Case. Like last night, the UFC fights were on. Mm -hmm. And I simply just wanted to watch the UFC fights, mm -hmm. right? I told everybody, I bought this TV, first TV I bought in forever. Mm -hmm. I've never had Netflix, nothing like that. I just mm -hmm. got that, which Kayla, my uh, personal assistant, helped me get Netflix and Great. set up the TV because I didn't know how to do that. I love that episode of you and Kayla. And uh, <laughs> she's the best. Um, and uh, so what was I talking about? I, I, you got me all this technology, technology, God, damn it. God dang it. <laughs> so I was trying to watch the UFC fight and I'm such a cheap fuck. <laughs> like I will not subscribe to ESPN plus. I don't care how, I, if it's a dollar, I won't sign up for it. I hate subscription stuff. That's why it took so long to do Netflix. Like, I just don't like that kind of stuff. I don't like subscription based, like, stuff because i'm not going to use it like netflix i get netflix i've maybe used it twice i don't even know what to watch and it's the same with espn i only want it for the ufc right mm -hmm. so i call my brother and i'm like hey what's your netflix <laughs> <to be> the <laughs> sign or your espn sign because yeah, yeah. i don't want to buy it you know and uh i couldn't figure out how to download the app I couldn't figure every time I tried putting in the email, I would hit the wrong button. It erased the email. Then I got to go back. It probably took me like no joke over 20 minutes to download ESPN app on the TV. Like it, it you can talk into it. It'll do it for you. And I couldn't figure that out. I kept bringing up Alexa or Alexis or whatever the hell it is. Somebody, somebody, um, some AI. But, uh, but yeah, so I do get frustrated with technology because it's like, I don't understand it. I'm like a baby about it. I get all frustrated and I kick and scream and I cry. All and of my your, binky. all of the stuff that you did growing up was all about physical labor, about being tough, about doing the thing. You never had to work with anything like that. Even at the bike shop, like, did you have like registers or anything? It was probably the most basic touch one thing and it's done. If it was anything more, you're already freaking out. Go ahead. Tell me. Dude, <laughs> the point of sale system I had at the bike shop the original one i got was literally like four buttons it was like bike accessory <laughs> tube change service That's that it. was it and i could just punch in the number because i was like if it's more than one screen and, mm -hmm. and four buttons i'll never figure it out so uh you're right though like when i was a kid I, like we had a nintendo mm -hmm. you know but yeah, all you had to do was blow in the cartridge to get it to work <laughs> right that was the most technical thing. Or a TV, you, could do. you just had to give it a little thump on the side. Yeah, just thump the TV, <laughs> it would work. Steal the neighbor's cable, get a black box, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but like I had a like the only thing I, I I cherished when I was a kid, or one of the one of the things I cherished was my BMX bike, right? Okay, yeah. Loved this. I mean it, I would sleep with it if I could. <laughs> but I got really good at fixing you know, my BMX bike. And I loved to go fishing constantly. I lived in uh, Northern Illinois next to Rock Cut State Park. Like our house, like butted up to the park, has this huge lake, Pierce Lake on it. I could get the reports, the fishing reports from the rangers. I would ride my bike into the park every day, all summer with my fishing pole in my tackle box. And I would go fishing. And I would like, you know, I got good with, you know, you know, re-reeling my mm -hmm. my my fishing line and picking out the right lures and tying knots Shit. and all that stuff and i would fish all the time i loved it i loved to fish i still do um but but yeah that's all like tangible things you can see and you fix like i always say i'd rather rebuild a carburetor than figure out how to turn this goddamn <laughs> computer on <laughs> <laughs> like the simplest things. I don't even know how to copy and paste using the keyboard. No. And I, I don't want to learn it. Like I, I just don't. 
No. To me, those things make so much more sense, though. Like, my brain works with it, and it's like, okay, I'm going from this spot into this spot. In order for that to make sense, it has to be channeled to this. And those things make sense for me. For some reason, when you get into it, like, it's the funniest thing. Like, it happens during our bloopers as well, where, like, if you're the, you're, you're sitting there and you're in front of the camera, you're trying to memorize what you're about to say. You're like, all right, I know what I'm going to say. All right, I got the intro. Okay, this, this, that, and I'm going to say. And as soon as you get to that point and you start tripping over your own words, you're like, God damn it. And, like, he has that one fucking moment. <laughs> Where he just loses everything. His accent comes out, and it's just like a mini temper tantrum. I've never, I don't know what the hell, I probably get that for other stuff too, because like I hate organization. And like if I have to look at an, like I don't like Excel. I can do almost everything, but if I have to like work with Excel, that kind of like minute detail will fucking kill me. Yeah. I can't do the, I don't know, is that, is that something you do like assistant wise? Do you have to like track like, like, okay, no. no. See, she doesn't do that. If I had to do that, that's, that's the worst part of my job. I'm, visionary i yeah. can understand the fucking vision i hate the execution of those things yeah so i understand where you are with that part. yeah i don't even know where we were going with all this but no. um but anyway what was the question did you ask one <laughs> no you were like hey guys i want to tell you about why i get pissed off and have these tantrums <laughs> but it is it's like a release valve like i'm i'm here all the time yeah and then i just need like one thing to go wrong and <laughs> i just, just gotta push you over the edge <laughs> then i'm back to I'm back to full. I never, you know what's funny? I never understood that until I started working around you because like, maybe it was like a little bit more of a corporate setting where you don't have somebody like that because like that gets like extinguished quickly. Like people having a tantrum and doing it or whatever, like everything is a lot more whatever. But like here in this job that I have, which is the first time I've had something like this, like Tony's just going to go off every once in a while over something really fucking stupid. Like, <laughs> it's just going to fucking go off. Like, what the fuck is this doing here? Like, it has nothing to do with his job. It has nothing to do with the productivity. He can just move on. But he's going to have that little thing, and then it's just going to be swept under, and everybody's going to be fine. And I've grown to just understand that about him, and then it also opened up my eyes to others because, frankly, my girlfriend is the exact same way. And I didn't put two and two together until I saw Tony having a tantrum. And then, like, she had the exact same one later that day. And I was like, this is the same thing happening. It's just, mm. they, you just need to blow off a little bit of steam well, and you're good. I think a, a, a part of it is being hyper vigilant. Like, I can, I notice. <laughs> I would every, love to see how you connect these two things. Go for well, it. Well, <laughs> I just, I notice every little thing and every little thing upsets me. <laughs> That's What's the problem. That? Like, you can be hyper vigilant and. I don't know. Can you be hyper just be vigilant aware of it and be okay with it it's, instead of it ticking you? That off. is tough. Uh, that is really tough. Yeah. So like hyper vigilance to me goes hand in hand with, I th dude. I think that's why it's really hard for me to sleep sometimes. Like there's certain things where because you know, like your brain's going all over the place. Mm -hmm. You hear things. You you see things. Mm -hmm. You notice every little thing. I remember I was at the bike shop one time. There was a wall between me and somebody who worked for me, mm -hmm. and I could he was a new guy, and I could hear him adjusting a seat with an impact wrench, right? Which I did a million times. Mm -hmm. And I could hear the impact wrench and the sound of it and the length of it and the sound of the clamp on the seat, and I just yelled over and said, and I explained to him what he did wrong and how to put the bracket back together because I could hear what was going on and he poked his head around. He's like, how'd you know I did that? And I was like, I just heard it. Like, I just heard it. Like, that's all I needed, you know? Cause, and I just hear, I notice these little things and it just, it drives me insane. You know what that ties into? Your music, your hypervigilance with your music too. You can hear something like that and you can play it right away or your attention to it and you know when something's off and it sounds just a little bit off. You've got, yeah, you've got like a little fucking ear thing going on. Yeah, it's, uh, I got a touch of the tism. <laughs> Got a touch, a touch of the, of the tism. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. No, that gets you canceled. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, so yeah, I don't even know how we got into all this, but I guess the the moral of the story is I'm a, I got a caveman brain that's hyper vigilant. I would just want to fix stuff. I'd rather carry rocks and put them in a pile than than do something technical i think is the the moral of the story let's just move stones around just no move reason. stones that's it yeah instead of organize them so um but yeah the last week we've had has been great here at the office if we're talking about what's been going on in my life we um i went snowboarding last weekend oh. first time in two years bought a new board all new equipment 
Thought I was going to be uh, really, really sore the next day. Wasn't. So that was a blessing yeah. at 40 years old to be able to go snowboarding. Yeah. It's funny because like whenever, you know, me and Eric go get a tattoo or, you know, me and my buddy Tony Massetti are sending pictures of new Nikes coming out or, you know, we go snowboarding on a whim. It's always like, were our dads doing this at 40 years old? Were our dads like getting tattoos and you know, my dad had a family and a drinking problem at 40 years old. <laughs> he was losing, he had a male pattern baldness and, a, and worked at a factory. We're over here just, uh, you know, doing whatever we want. It's, it, it, it's awesome. Yeah. Like, I think we're going to stay young forever if we keep it. I don't know about all that, but I do think that it's a different mentality entirely. Yeah. I, I know that it happens with my generation for sure. We don't, we don't look at, at goals the same like that, you know, like the white picket fence isn't isn't sought after in my opinion I, don't, I know that's definitely not what the hell you want you know no. like w well with that being said what do you see yourself being then if you don't want the white picket fence yeah i mean the thought of living in the suburbs makes me want to jump off a cliff what like, do you that mean? is torture to me <laughs> like to be out there have a bunch of neighbors all over uh, the yeah just your cookie cutter house in a neighborhood with yeah the, none, none of that appeals to me mm -hmm. like i'm either i want to be in a big city or somewhere in the mountains where I can, you know, adventure and ride a dirt bike and shoot guns and do all that kind America. of stuff. America. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I like the, the, the normality of, of, uh, of just a, uh, everyday life in the suburbs, clocking in, clocking out, working for the man. I saw something today on Instagram that was like a, made so much sense. It was like, you know, your nine to five is somebody else's passive income. Mm -hmm. Like your nine to five is somebody else's passive income. We always talk about as entrepreneurs of like, hey, like, how do you make more money? How do you get passive income? All this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it comes with having employees and stuff like that and having investments. But, you know, when you when you have a nine to five, when you're working for a big corporation or something, you're just another way that they get passive income. And it was just kind of one of those things like, I don't know. I've never, people ask me like, Oh, you know, do you think you, you think you're going to get married have kids, all that stuff? It's like, I don't know. I never really think about it. Like I'm always on to like the next thing, the next adventure, the next, you know, um, uh, whatever can create freedom for myself. It doesn't seem like having a bunch of kids and, and living in this uh, cookie cutter life is creating any type of freedom for me. Mm -hmm. Not to say that, it's not right for somebody else. I'm not yeah. saying that at all. It's just not right for me. And I don't know where that stems from. I've never been able to figure it out, but it's never, I've never woken up and been like, man, I wish I had a couple of kids and a wife and lived in the suburbs right now. People don't make it sound that good either. Every time you hear them, it's just horror stories. From well, them. there wouldn't be 70% divorces if it was great. Yeah. I mean, how many people do you know that is like, oh, I love my wife. I met when I was 20 years old and my two kids are, you know, angels. They never do anything wrong. <laughs> um it, it just yeah it, it, a lot of bad examples out there i guess yes. and that's what we grew up around and that's what the hell we we look at mm -hmm. i can't see it i can't see it becoming a trend for it like I, I definitely think that we went in general in life i always think that things swing in one direction to one extreme of the spectrum and then they swing into the other side and eventually all we're looking for is somewhere that's actually in that perfect middle for it i don't know where that perfect middle lies for that but I do think there's going to be a lot less people having kids and getting married and want to do this. And work from home has been a big change for it as well. Like people being able to, to just get up, be on their couch and do that. And that's been good and bad, though. Like we've seen it here in the office. Like I, I can't imagine working from home anymore. I mm -hmm. can't imagine going home and not having like every single person here, you know, telling me what it is that I'm doing or being able to tweak this or see Tony's face or react to that. Like there's different things that 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 exists now. I was talking to my Uber driver about this. He's got kids that are like not looking for a home now. They're not looking to get married anymore. They're working from home. Like it's just a different life entirely. But I don't know if I'd want to go from the work from home life. Like that's not. Well, I think everybody thought it was like this great idea when COVID happened. Everybody's like, oh, I could just sit at home. This is going to be awesome. I can work on my own terms. But I think now there's like a resurgence of people like, I mean, I've been interviewing people um, over the phone, you know, uh, to get people in here for, for a dispo position. So yeah, if anybody wants a, a dispo position, <laughs> if you're good at sales, you've done sales, DM me. Cause, cause we're looking to hire, but a lot of people, there's been two people last week that said, yeah, I've been working from home the last three or four years and I'm just sick of it. Like I need to be in an office. I need to be around some energy. Like mm -hmm. I'm not growing here at home. Mm -hmm. It'd be really hard to grow at home 
if if you didn't have that energy around you it would take a very special person to be that self-motivated yeah there are a few roles and a few people that can do that i'd seen uh mr i'd seen uh david olds talking about this as well where you get a short term you know cut probably where you're like all right i don't have the overhead of this business anymore and i don't have to worry about the lights being on at this or paying the rent for what's going on and that's like a short term all right i'm not paying five thousand dollars a month six thousand dollars a month or whatever it is but the productivity that's lost from it when you don't see your team when you don't interact with them when all you have is a zoom meeting i remember he said that line and i could just picture it imagine you sitting there all fucking day on a zoom meeting that's the only interaction you have with anybody you're losing your fucking mind lose it like there is a little bit of a dream like you know quality about that and oh it's so great it'd be awesome to only have to check in for this but like we need human fucking interaction we're mm -hmm. dying without that stuff like, well you said something so right about like when you see people's faces and body language and all that like you need that to understand what somebody's going through or even if you're in a if you're in a bad mood if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something's going on in your life and you're constantly in the same room and the same house like how do you get away from that you need a change of scenery sometimes mm -hmm. i know there's a lot of people here and it, it it's been for me too where you know there's a lot of outside stuff going on and you can use an office and the people around you as this safe haven to keep your mind off of mm -hmm. what's going on we need that break um i think it's super important to uh to go somewhere every day and and um and interact with people for sure we're like our lives are, are absolutely like compartmentalized too and there's times where let's say you're having a, sh a shitty day at home you have work to be able to lean on and say, all right, well, that's going to make me feel a little bit better. Or if you had a bad day at work, you can say, well, shit, at least I can go home and talk to my kids. Yeah, there's a what separation. What the hell happens when that's everything There's every a separation day? of, uh, yeah, church and state, as they say. <laughs> you need it. So, um, but anyway, so that's uh, the last week, I guess. Yeah. Went snowboarding, wasn't sore. That that ran into a, a great conversation with Gio, as, as little things always do. He's got a great mind over here, horrible hair, and Damn. terrible decisions on outfits, but uh, the mind on this guy, I love it. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's, let's get into the rapid fire questions, because I put on uh, social media today yes. a couple question boxes, and I'm yes. sure there's some people with some wild questions the, yeah the first one's actually absolutely autistic i would say well uh, let's say this i don't <laughs> read these before just correct. so everybody knows i want a real real time reaction to these questions yes great good luck uh number one does your pee, pee turn into a vagina when you cold plunge well that's a personal <laughs> question you hold on i want to just ask a question you want answered on the podcast uncensored that's pretty uncensored. Does my pee-pee turn to a vagina when I cold plunge? That's quote-unquote what the question was. Um, I haven't uh, noticed, really. I'm okay. sure it does. <laughs> there's shrinkage. I'm sure there's shrinkage. Do women know about shrinkage? Women don't know about shrinkage. Women know about shrinkage, right? You get into a cold swimming pool, it shrinks. Okay, she knows about like shrinkage. Like a scared turtle. <laughs> Um, I mean, the water's 50 degrees. I'm sure there's some uh, there's some shrinkage going yeah, on there. Yeah, but not a, it's not an Audi turning into an Indy. No, God, yeah, no, no. Not. I got a, I'm okay enough where, yeah, it doesn't go inside me. Question number two. <laughs> Biggest challenge working with Eric. <laughs> Biggest mm. challenge working with Eric. Wow. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but it, let me, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, the guy's got insane drive and energy right and you know eric's one of my best friends known him for 20 years we were really good friends we used to be roommates when we were in our early 20s um and having a business relationship with somebody you're really good friends with there's gonna be challenges mm -hmm. you know there's uh there's how do you separate being a best friend with somebody to um, having hard conversations at work or trying to have the same vision or the same goals or something like that. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I would say the biggest challenge is we are such good friends outside of the office. So trying to separate those two things, you know, I think, I think especially, Especially, do I say that right? You Especially, you say a lot of things wrong. You said that yeah, because right. dude, I listen back to these podcasts sometimes, <laughs> and my accent gets so bad sometimes Just for the weirdest words. Yeah, because I lived in California for so long, it's like my accent got screwed up. If I would have stayed in Chicago, 
it would have been just been a Chicago just accent. One way. But now it's like a mix between the two. It's like a lazy Chicago accent. But uh, it's especially, I, I can't remember. Man, what was I just saying about Eric? So a uh, friend going to business, especially, God dang it, roll the tape back. <laughs> I forget my train of thought because of that. Um, but when you're good friends with somebody, especially in the beginning when we first started is Look where I was going. Look at that. See, well it came done. right back yeah. around. Um, where... How do you, you got to figure out how to have those conversations because it's like, you're looking at this person as your buddy, your friend. And it's like, Hey, I want to, I want to bring this up, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. So I'm just not going to talk about it. I don't want them to think I'm mad at them. So I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah. And then that shit builds up and then it's irritating. And then you finally have a conversation about it. And it's way worse than it could have been if you had just said something in the beginning, mm -hmm. because it's all perspective too. It's like, sometimes you're thinking um, somebody's doing something and it mm -hmm. has something to do with you, but it really has nothing to do with you. Um, or they don't see it the same way you do. And mm -hmm. sometimes you need that outside influence to be like, Hey, you're doing this, that, and the other, I feel like you're doing it wrong. Or I feel like there's a better way to do it. Or here's my idea. Yeah. Maybe we can do it this way. And then you have a discussion about it rather than, letting it go on for months and then being like, dude, this is what happened. I never said anything, but I've been irritated about it for three months. Um, so I think that's, uh, if, if it's a challenge at all, well, yeah, I guess it's a challenge. I, I shouldn't try to backpedal this question. To, I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying not to hurt Eric's feelings. Um, but I don't think he would be hurt uh, saying that, though. I, I do think, you know, uh, being in business with a friend, there's always going to be differences of opinion on, on certain things. And you're just going to have to have the conversations before they fester, mm -hmm. which I think we do a better job of now, mm -hmm. um, hopefully. And, uh, and yeah, but it, you know, there's like five people in my life I would take a bullet for and Eric Klein is one of them. So, uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it's nothing. So, so crazy that we we can't, couldn't work through it yeah more so than anything and this is something i've gotten from being around him is like you're never you're never going to find someone who's just more motivated to do the thing than eric is and being around that energy and that drive is absolutely contagious for different areas of your life like you'll find a way like i found ways to incorporate in my life in in, in something but being around that like there is no downside to that and eric is one of those people too who will address things and let you know what it is that's that's that is going to be either going the right way or just not going to be going at all mm -hmm. and that that clarity and that upfrontness is something that is extremely refreshing too so if if i could talk about the the, the easiest thing about it or the best thing about it if you want to you know tail on to that i would absolutely say that that is one of the best things about working with or around eric yeah and i think with me eric and shyla being business partners um, there's a lot of discussions we have where every one of us has cried in a, in a meeting before, Damn. like where we've gotten emotional. Um, I mean, it, it happens. Anybody in business with somebody like my last business at the bike shop with, with my old business partner, we had to have tough, tough conversation. I mean, it's going to happen no matter what. Um, it, it just can be a little more difficult when you're such good friends with that person. And there's like this separate, you know, you got to figure out the separation because if you were just in business with somebody, mm -hmm. you would just be having business conversations, mm -hmm. you know, but me and Eric travel together. I mean, his son, Kai calls me uncle Tony. He, Kai literally thought I was his literal uncle until he was, <laughs> until he was like eight years old. Hey, hold on. You're not related. Yeah. To me. <laughs> um, but, but it, it, yeah, it's been, it's been an absolute, absolute blessing. And to have three different personalities, me, Eric and Shyla, I think they do marry well, um, together because if you had three Tonys, it would be difficult. Three Shilas would be difficult. Three Eric's would be difficult. So, everybody's got a different personality, different views on life and business. And, and, you know, we need Eric for that crazy motivation and that crazy vision and, mm -hmm. and reaching the highest standards and practices and, and, you know, um, in entrepreneurship and building things and all that. He's got this crazy vision on business. Mm -hmm. And then Shyla kind of corrals, um, you know, me and Eric's, uh, shotgun ideas or ways we want to change things or our emotions sometimes get in the way. And she's like, you guys got to, 
you know, you guys got to call me before you make any decisions um, is her thing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a blessing. So uh, next question on here, and this is going to be jumping into some more of the wholesaling. Quickest route to getting a deal as a total newbie. Quickest route getting a deal as a total newbie. So I'm going to go a different direction because everybody mm -hmm. talks about acquisitions and, you know, yeah. All you got to do is buy data, call, call through it, call through <laughs> it and find somebody that wants to sell you a house at a discount. Pound the phones. Pound the phones. That's it. I mean, it's it's a pretty simple equation. You could pull a niche data of, you know, pre-foreclosures or yeah. tax delinquents or, you know, uh, pre-probate, something mm -hmm. like that. Some, some type of motivation, divorce, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it could be. And you could either text that data, call it yourself, send it to a cold caller. Now they got AI making those, those phone calls oh, and figuring out who's motivated, send that to you and then just get them under contract at a discount. So I think what people don't talk about enough in the wholesaling space, being a one man show is JVing deals on the dispo side. Like mm -hmm. you talk about, you watch any guru in wholesaling and they're going to tell you you need little to no money to get started in wholesaling. You're going to use someone else's money. Use somebody else's money. Um, you can flip houses for free, all this kind of stuff. And most of it's a lot. I mean, you need money to get started. You need education, which costs money. Mm -hmm. You need data, which costs money. You need, you need software that costs money. Mm -hmm. You need um, scripts that cost money. You need a CRM. You need to hire cold callers. You need to, you know, build an AI out. You got to send tech. All this stuff costs money. It could cost you 10 grand before you get your first deal. Mm -hmm. And that's not even hard to do. Like you could easily spend 10 grand before you get your first deal. But on the dispo side of things, you can literally get started with zero money mm -hmm. because you can just make phone calls, build a buyer's list, post on the Facebook investment groups, get people's information, go to REI meetups, mm -hmm. go to local REI meetups in your town and get every investor's information, do agent outreach. It's all just relationship building. Yeah. And then once you have a good enough buyers list in a specific market, get on everybody's buyers list that's wholesaling nationwide. Mm -hmm. And when they send you a deal, reach out to them and say, hey, can I JV this? I have a robust buyers list in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And then get that deal, wholesale it to somebody, JV it, you know, for from the wholesaler to the buyer, and then make a percentage of that deal. Like that is a way you can truly get into wholesaling with no money. And the only it's thing just you have to time. Do. Yeah. Like we either have time or money. It's it, it's rare that we have both. You right? Trade off. You got to trade off. And if you don't have a ton of money and you want to get into wholesaling, I would say that's the best route to take. Maybe I'm biased because I do it and I know it can be done, mm -hmm. and I know it's not that difficult. Um, but if you truly don't have any money, like that is a way to make money in wholesaling. You and you don't have to have. Like the, the dispo side of it is so much easier because as you mentioned, you're just looking at getting relationships. If you know the guy who needs this, that's all you have to have. Just the knowledge of that. You don't have to buy a list. You don't have to do anything. If you go around, you shake enough hands. If you build a network yourself, that's all that's needed for this. And like that is so much more uh, lean, I guess, than it would be having to start something in acquisitions. For anybody who's like been in that space at all, just think about how many people are trying to get rid of deals. Think about how many times you've heard somebody needing a JV. I don't have a buyer. I'm looking for a buyer. I've got a contract. If everybody's out there locking up contracts and there's a bunch of people who don't have these things dispo, who don't have a, a buyer in hand, you can be that person for it. You can be that resource. So well, love dude, that you touched on that. New Western, the biggest wholesale company in the country, all they do is JV deals. Like yeah, they let they let everybody else spend all the money on data, have all the overhead for the offices, hire people, do all that kind of stuff for acquisitions, sift through all that data, make all the phone calls, hours and hours of phone calls, hundreds of conversations to get a contract. And then they just say, hey, give me that contract. I'll go get rid of it for you. And all they focus on is building relationships and grabbing grabbing contracts from wholesalers so if you want to put it in that perspective never even thought about that yeah i mean jving deals can i i mean uh jr clutch 
has a huge JV company in San Antonio, Texas. Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy kills it. He he owns that town. Anybody gets a deal in San Antonio, sends it to Clutch, and he gets rid of it because he has such a good relationship with buyers there. Um, yeah, it's JV and is, is the way to go. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question for this too. Um, how do you skip trace properties that are under trust or LLC? A lot of a lot of newbies have this question. This has been coming around for at least the entire year that I've been around you. I did not know that question was going to be on here, but that's why I'm wearing the Skip Matrix T-shirt. Lift up the things. Oh shoot, sorry. Skip Matrix. If you guys have, and this is totally a coincidence, but. <laughs> Um, the, if you guys do have trustees, LLCs, really tough stuff to skip, skip matrix is the best, highest quality skip tracing that I've ever come across. They've skipped lists for me and I've seen the results. I know that a lot of people will, and I agree with this and this is, um, it might be controversial, um, to skip matrix, but it's happening every day where, People will, they'll get a ton of data skipped, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll go for a a cheaper price. They'll go for, you know, uh, six cents. For 10,000 records. For 10,000 records. And over over time, that does save money, Mm -hmm. right? But look at it in this perspective, though. A lot, I know customer, I know clients, I know people in wholesaling Mm -hmm. that do that. And then they take all the data that couldn't get skipped. Mm-hmm. with that skip tracing company and they send it to skip matrix and skip matrix takes the data this company couldn't even get skipped and they have like a 92 percent hit rate on it so it's like are you are you are you spending more money or are you making more money mm-hmm. when you're using a better quality product mm-hmm. you know how many And think about this too. I I said this the other day Mm -hmm. because everybody's using the same type of skip tracing, right? And if everybody's using this, if 90% of the industry is using this and a portion of that data doesn't get skipped, it's not getting skipped for anybody. We're all pulling the same list. We're all using the same skip tracers. Mm -hmm. So what type of advantage would you have using a better skip tracing company? Right. Yeah. Even if it start off by taking the bad da- the data that your company couldn't skip trace, send it to skip matrix, see the return on that yeah. and then realize how much money you're leaving on the table. Mm-hmm. Because those people that nobody else has skipped are not getting called nearly as much as the easy skip data to skip yeah does that make did i explain that yeah correctly? you are are you a little like, fish inside of a big pond or are you a big fish inside of a little pond right no. like if there's a portion of this data that never gets skip traced because we're all using the same stuff like send it to skip matrix get it skipped now you're one of two people calling this lead instead of one of a thousand people calling this lead so um i think that is a, a great strategy but you should use you know skip matrix for definitely for LLCs and trustees because they don't they don't only pull that person's data they'll grab their next of kin they'll they'll grab so much data like yep. if you need to get a hold of somebody you definitely will that's the guy and use promo code Tony skip <laughs> matrix promo code Tony uh, you get some type of discount I don't yep. remember what it is but you get a discount yep um, next one when listing cash deals on the MLS what key difference is there in underwriting cash deals on the MLS, what key difference to underwriting? Well, I wouldn't say there's major differences in underwriting. It's still a wholesale deal if you're putting it out there for cash. So the one thing that people need to pay attention to, though, is the for sale properties on the MLS. Because a lot of people will just look at sold comps Mm -hmm. 90 days back, six months back. But the most current data is going to be what's pending on the MLS, what's listed on the MLS. Mm -hmm. So look at your deal through the eyes of somebody looking on the MLS. Just pull up Zillow and say, I'm a buyer in this neighborhood and I got X amount to spend. Let me see what's out there. Let me see what I think is a good deal. Mm -hmm. How's your deal going to stand up to the rest of those deals that are listed and going pending? Mm -hmm. Is it even a good deal? 
And you should be doing this whether you're listing it on the MLS or sending it to your buyers. Mm -hmm. Because if you think it's a good deal and then you look on the MLS and you're like, well, shit, there's three properties out there that are in better shape than mine and they're listed for cheaper than I'm going to send mine out for. No wonder you're getting crickets on this deal. Yeah. So I think the for sale and the pending immediate stuff, our, our current data that we can analyze is most important for listing on the MLS or sending to a buyer's list. The, the real estate market has always been able to kind of uh, linger a little bit and rely on that past data. But ever since the pandemic uh, and, that, and that market like went down, now it's like on its way back up the comps that you were having are getting newer and newer every single time buyers are asking you they're like nope not six months anymore three months nope not three months anymore one month and the best way to go about doing that is pending so you're sitting there wasting your time if you're trying to dispo something and you're looking at comps six months to a year back you're gonna get beat up on that by the investor on the other end by the agent on the other end like there's no point in even looking that far back anymore that's not where the market is moving. Yeah, and it, it was one thing I realized when the market did shift, because I was like, we definitely can't go six, back six months anymore. Yeah. And I was like, for a while, we can't even go back three months. Like, for a while, we were only relying on listed properties because if you think about a property that's been, that's been marked sold on Zillow that you're trying to comp, mm-hmm. even if it was 90 days ago, they might have put that offer in a 100 uh, 120 days ago Mm -hmm. or 180 days ago how long did it take from offer to close so 90 days back is really way over 100 days back Mm -hmm. from what the market was doing when that offer was put on it Mm -hmm. you know so i think pending properties is the most current data you should be looking at yeah and it's what investors are gonna are gonna beat you up for uh, next one, I'm an agent in Sacramento, California, finding MLS deals for cash buyers want to go direct to seller advice. Yeah, the, we just talked about it, you know, <laughs> I mean, th- there's definitely a strategy for finding deals on the MLS, getting them under contract. And, you know, it, especially in your backyard, if you're an agent in Sacramento and you have a good buyers and you know yeah. the market well, it's a lot easier for that person to look on the MLS, analyze the data and be like, hey, if I get this at this price, I know this buyer is going to buy it. Mm-hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, you're kind of limited. So it, if you're trying to go direct to seller, which you should be because that's where all the big spreads are, you need to just like we talked about, buy data, get it skipped, traced, text it, cold call it, use AI, mm-hmm. whatever you have to do get those those warmer leads coming in and you got to get on the phones and, and close the deal. If you're just doing it in Sacramento, have an appointment setter and say, you know, you would just need one person to sift through the good leads and send you out to these appointments in person and get the deal under contract. Makes sense. All right. That's all that we have today for the rapid fire questions. I appreciate you guys submitting stuff. You can always put them inside the comments here in YouTube. And then obviously anything that we post on the Instagram stories, you can always uh, put your questions in there. Tony will answer anything. As we anything. Found yeah. We talked about the PP vagina one. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for joining us again. As always, love doing these. Uh, keep uh, sharing and commenting and liking and uh send them to your friends like why not send the podcast to your friends if you're not normal they're probably not normal yeah and you are not normal because you're watching this i'll see you guys at the top